Good morning, Fellowship family. How are y'all doing this morning? I missed y'all last week. Uh, me and a couple other Fellowship fellows were um, out uh, leading uh, the music at an event, so that was a blessing, but I sure did miss getting to worship with y'all. Um, I was going to try to memorize this and impress y'all, but I'm just going to pull up my phone and read my thoughts that I had last night preparing for this morning. Um, I've already said it. Good morning, Fellowship family. I've got that written down. Um, today, we are continuing on in our rhythm series, and we will be focusing on worship. And wow. I only have one wow, but wow, wow, wow. I'll add two more today. What a big word that can encompass so much. There are probably endless amounts of ways to attribute worth to someone or something, but this morning, we are gonna aim our worship directly towards Jesus. We're gonna worship through singing, through baptism, through giving, and through the teaching of God's Word. So before we get rolling, I want us to take a moment to slow down, take a deep breath, and begin to focus on the Lord. Let's take a moment to set our minds and our affections on the Lord to consider everything the Father has accomplished in and through Jesus, Christ for us, Christ in us and with us, and Christ through us, and then attribute great worth to Jesus this morning. Can we do that? Attribute great worth to Jesus. And whether it's with a loud hallelujah with your mouth or a quiet wow and thank you in your heart, let's join together and let's worship Jesus. Would you stand? as we start singing together.
up praise this morning. This is a great day, Fellowship. We're celebrating a life change this morning. I had occasion to meet uh, Ken Waiter uh, about two and a half years ago, and I and my brothers here have had a front row seat at watching the Holy Spirit change Ken's heart. And uh, we're here today. He's here to to celebrate with you and stand before his church uh, and declare that Jesus Christ is his Savior, and he wants to walk with him and follow him all the days of his life. Is that true, Ken? Absolutely. Well, it is my privilege then as your brother in Christ. Go ahead and sit down. It is my privilege then as your brother in Christ uh, and your friend to baptize you in the name of the Holy, you know, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and God the Son. Buried with Christ in death, raised to walk in newness of life. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken 
every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Then came the morning That sealed the promise Your very body picture that was what a great picture that was that we have shared in the death and the resurrection of Jesus and that he's carried us through that by his grace and his mercy in Adam we were dead spiritually dead there was no life in us Jesus is the resurrection and the life and now we are fully alive with the life of our risen Savior amen amen we're going to go into giving we don't usually do this i don't usually lead these kind of moments but it's a call and response and so you'll see leader that's me and then people that's everybody else and so before we give we're just going to again we're just going to aim it at jesus we're going to just aim it at the gospel and we're going to worship through giving so here we go oh father giver of all every good and perfect gift comes from you we ask you to accept these gifts and use them to your glory here we go may they bring shelter to the homeless comfort to the sick rest to the weary and hope to the helpless as you multiply the offering of fish and loaves multiply these to accomplish more than we could ever ask or imagine we give freely and not under compulsion for all we have is yours lord Nothing we can give could match your great gifts to us, your Son, and your Spirit. Amen. Fellowship, you can be seated. Fullness 
of God in hell. This way, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save. Till on that cross, I see the The wrath of God was Light of the world by darkness Sing this together. Bless the Lord, all my soul. So bless the Lord, all my soul. Sing like this. Sing it together again. Bless. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my soul, I will worship your holy name. Oh, I Father, we're so grateful and thankful for everything you've accomplished, not only for our past, not only for our present, and not only for our future, in and through Jesus. Father, we aim our worship to Jesus this morning. We say, wow, and we say thank you. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. We were created to worship. Deep down at the core of our being, we have a predisposition to worship someone or something. We're hardwired for it. 
we have a, a hunger and thirst for awe and wonder. And we are instinctively seeking things that are admirable or worthy of praise. We react with amazement when we see or when we experience or when we find ourselves in the presence of something that is extraordinary or glorious. And the propensity to worship is deep-seated. It's ingrained within us. You could say it this way, that when it comes to the human race, worship of someone or something is inevitable. You were created to worship. That's why we take pictures of beautiful sunsets and majestic mountains. That's why we jump up and down when we see a walk-off home run or a, a buzzer-beating jump shot. That's why we take selfies when we're near a celebrity or, or you pay $500 for a Taylor Swift ticket. We want to be in the presence of something that is profound, something that is exceptional. We want to see and experience the uncommon. We want to behold beauty and power and majesty. We want to pay homage, to give adoration to something or someone that transcends the everyday normal life that we are living. Author Kevin DeYoung said it this way. We will all worship someone or something. The question is whether we will worship the right one in the right way. Well, we are continuing in our summer series entitled Rhythms. In this series, our aim has been to drill down deep to focus on some daily habits, some spiritual practices. You could call them um, sacred routines or holy habits. And, and we want to help you focus on just the blocking and tackling the basic things of the faith like prayer and fasting and reading scripture, and confession, and today we're going to focus on the topic of worship. I do have some goals for today, some intended outcomes. First, I want us to just do some theological thinking on the topic of worship. Then I want us to try to clearly define what worship is, and maybe even broaden the box that you have worship in and then I want us to talk about some practical things, navigating some issues, some things that come at us at Fellowship Rogers when it comes to worship, and then finally leave you with an application challenge for you to go deeper in your worship life. So first, let's do some theological thinking. Here's the initial thought. God is worthy of worship. I would even say it this way, that only God is worthy of our worship. Only he deserves to be in the unrivaled place of honor and reverence in our lives. From eternity past to eternity future, he will be glorified and praised, for he is the creator and the ruler and the sustainer of all that exists. Revelation chapter four, verses 10 and 11, paint a beautiful picture of God being worshiped and honored in heaven. Let me read it to you. It says, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. In the passage, there's a vision of God being worshiped in heaven. And he is portrayed as the great ruler seated on his throne, and he is surrounded by worshipers, 24 elders, who lie on their faces before him. What a beautiful picture of worship. Their crowns are laid at his feet. And he is pictured as the eternal king, the one who was and is and is to come. And not only did they assume a posture of worship, they are praising him with their words. They say, you are worthy, our Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. 
acknowledging him as the sovereign creator and sustainer of the universe. What a beautiful and appropriate picture of worship. We see in the passage a recognition of who God truly is. They, they put God in his proper place, and then we see a proper response. So our theological thinking about worship begins with a simple yet profound thought that God is worthy of our worship. Amen? But there's a problem. Even though we as humans are hardwired to worship, and even though we will worship someone or something, and even though it's true that God is worthy of our worship, our worship is corrupted. It's hindered by our sin nature. Romans chapter one describes the corruption of our worship due to our fallen condition in this way. Verse 21 says, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and foolish and their hearts were darkened. The passage is describing people in sin and without Christ. And despite evidence of God's existence all around them, they chose not to glorify him. They chose not to worship him because of their darkened hearts, because of their misguided thinking. Verse 25 bookends the thought. It says, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. God's creation abandoned its creator. They turned away from him and refused to give him the glory and the honor and the power and the praise and the gratitude that is due him. Falling into darkness, they worshiped the things around them instead of the one who created them. And this is true of all of us apart from Christ. You see, without Jesus, we are corrupted by sin. We're actually unable to enter into the presence of nor commune with a holy God. We are blinded to the the glory and the majesty of God. Our hearts are darkened to such an extent that we even lack a desire to worship the Almighty. And in our foolish and futile thinking, we replace worship of the Creator with worshiping and serving created things instead because don't forget worship of someone or something is inevitable and so we replace the worshiping of God with things around us and I don't know if you've noticed we'll worship just about anything we'll worship our work we'll worship our stuff we'll worship our experiences We end up workaholics and alcoholics and we become materialistic and self-focused. We fall into consumerism and hedonism, moving from thing to thing and from high to high, trying to find something that is worthy of our attention, of our allegiance, of our adoration. And ultimately, we can never find it. So the search never ends because only God is worthy of, of worship. So our sin condition, it darkens our heart, it corrupts our thinking, it poisons our ability to worship and commune with the holy, almighty God. But that's not the end of the story, right? You see, the Lord sent his son, Jesus, to restore a fallen world, and that potential exists for you and for me. Jesus entered this fallen world to reconcile us back to the Father and to restore our ability to worship him with a pure heart through repentance of our sin, through faith in his death and resurrection. We are rescued by the grace and the mercy of God who sent his son to to bear the weight of our sin, to free us from its penalty and corruption. Colossians chapter one says it beautifully. Maybe this is your story. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. That's your life before Christ. 
But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. For those of you who know Jesus, that's your current position in Christ. You see, in Christ, our ability to commune with God is restored. And if you've been coming around fellowship for the last few weeks, months, or years, I just want you to know that's our story. We are a fallen people redeemed by the mercy of God through the work of Jesus Christ. Our response is to repent of sin and believe in the one he has sent, and we invite you to join us. One theologian said this, that true worship requires new birth. True worship requires new birth by grace. Through faith alone, in Christ alone, we are redeemed and restored. We are renewed and enabled to enter into authentic worship. It's through the redemptive work of Christ that our eyes are opened, that our hearts are made alive. And then and only then can we truly recognize and respond to the majesty and the splendor and the glory and the love and the power of the Almighty. So it's by his mercy that we can genuinely worship the Lord. And that's what we were created to do. One of my favorite theologians, A.W. Tozer, said it this way. We are saved to worship God. All that Christ has done for us in the past and all that he is doing now leads to this one end. You were created to worship. We just need to make sure that we're worshiping the right one in the right way. Now we have some goals this morning. Uh, let's move from our theological thinking about worship and let's try to get to a working definition of worship. How do you define the act of worship? H have you ever thought about that? What is Worship. If someone were to say that I worshiped the Lord today, what does that mean? What did they do? Now, for many of you, you are immediately going to go to the concept of singing, singing hymns and choruses and, and songs to the Lord. Others, you might have included that in attendance of a worship gathering or a worship service. I worshiped today at Fellowship Rogers. Now, both of these statements are true, but I want us to think about worship a little more broadly. And, and I wanna try to give you a working definition to guide that thought, and it's really gonna center around two concepts. The first concept is recognition that's seeing God. It involves revelation about God. And the other concept is response, recognition and reaction or response. When we worship, we genuinely recognize who God is and then respond in an appropriate way. So here's an attempt. I'll borrow a definition from our own Mickey Rapier. Worship is seeing God for who he really is and giving a proper response. We, we truly see him, his awesome power and nature, his, his heart and love and grace and mercy are revealed to us. And then we react, we respond in an appropriate way. There's recognition and there's response. Worship is seeing God for who he really is and then giving a proper response. Now, is this a biblically accurate definition? Should we check Mickey's work? Do we see this in the scripture? Well, absolutely. Let me, let me show you just a few quick snapshots of recognition response. First, let's just go right back to that Revelation chapter four passage. It says that the 24 elders, the worshipers, fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. You're seeing their response immediately. They're worshiping him. They lay their crowns before the throne. They're they're responding, they're worshiping him. They say, you are worthy. They're praising him. They're responding, oh Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Well, here's why. Here's what they know about him. Here's what's been revealed to them. This is their recognition. 
For you created all things. And by your will they were created and have their being. They're recognizing the Lord as the, the eternal king enthroned in heaven who is the sustainer of the universe. And then they respond by bowing and praising. We see both recognition and response. Let's try another one. Let's skip over to Isaiah chapter six. This is one of my favorite passages about worship. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Right off the bat, we have recognition. Well, what did Isaiah see? I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two, they covered their face. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying, and they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his what? His glory, they're worshiping. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. God revealed himself to the prophet Isaiah. He got an inside look at the throne room of heaven. And what did he see? He saw powerful angelic beings, supernatural angelic beings flying around. He saw vast robes that filled the temple. He, he saw smoke and the foundation shaking at their, their voices. Well, that's recognition. Well, how did he respond? Well, look at verse five. Upon seeing the majesty and holiness of God, he said, woe to me. I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the king the Lord Almighty. His reaction was to actually see his sin and fall before a holy God in confession. When Isaiah saw the power and the majesty and the holiness of God, it was a mirror revealing the corruption in his own heart. We're observing a pattern here. Worship is recognition and response. Let's jump to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 28. This is Resurrection Sunday. Some ladies have gone to the tomb and found it to be empty. It tells the story. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and they ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they came to him and clasped his feet and worshiped him. These ladies saw the resurrected Christ. There's our recognition. And what was their first instinct when they're put into that moment of awe and wonder? They ran to him. They fell at his feet and they worshiped him, bowing before him, pouring out their love and their adoration and their praise and their honor. Do you see it in the snapshots? Worship is seeing God for who he truly is. There's a revelation aspect to it. And then we give a proper response. Okay. So how do we do that in our daily lives? How do we see God and respond appropriately? Let's think about that together. How do you see God? Well, I think an obvious answer at Fellowship Bible Church is we see God through the what? Bible. You see God revealed to you through the word of God, the, the scriptures. So as you read, as you hear the word taught, as you study, God reveals his nature and his attributes. He tells stories of how he has worked. And when you see that revelation, your heart is prompted to respond to him. Well, okay, that's an easy one. How else do you see God? Well, I don't know about you, but I see God's power and majesty through nature. Anybody else? This is not an excuse to fish and hunt on Sundays. I've heard guys say that. Man, I'd love to join you for your little song service, but I gotta go shoot a deer to worship. <laughs> I am an outdoorsman. I would much rather be outside than inside all the time, and I see God's handiwork. Psalm 19 resonates with me. It opens up and says, the heavens Declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim his handiwork. Any sunset picture takers out there? We get it. It says day by day, they pour forth speech. Night by night, they speak, they reveal knowledge. 
Creation testifies to the beauty and the power and the creativity of the creator. Okay, okay. Word, nature, what else? How else can you see God? What about witnessing the power of his mighty hand in someone's life? Perhaps through a healing. Now, I'm not talking about a guy in a white suit saying, be healed. You may believe in that. Good for you. But what about someone who's given their last months, they prepare to meet the Almighty. They go back in for their test, and the oncologist comes back and says, I cannot explain this. I know you're a person of prayer. As a person of faith, I can explain it, but as a physician, I can't. It's gone. I've heard it time and time again. God doesn't always heal, but sometimes he intervenes. And at that point, we see his power and we worship. How else do you see him? What about through provision? Have you ever been to your, the end of your rope? You looked at your bank account and the numbers don't make sense. You don't know how you're going to pay the bill or, or take care of what you need to. And the Lord shows up in an unexpected way. And at that point, you see him, Jehovah Jireh, the great provider, and you worship. What about through a life change story where you hear of transformation of someone far from God coming near to God? Or what about through loving community or through God's providential hand working in circumstances or through answered prayer or just through the whisper of the Holy Spirit. We see God. Do you get it? Broaden your box on how you see him. And then we respond in an appropriate way. So what's an appropriate way to respond in worship? Well, let's knock the obvious one out of the way. Is singing an appropriate response? But it's not the only one. We do sing. We express joy and gratefulness in our heart and our communal and private times. But what about giving? That, that we respond to seeing God through tithing, giving a portion of what he's provided for us or through offerings or through generosity. I know many of you give online. And so it might be awkward for you when we do a prayer like we did today and the offering plate comes by and your neighbor's like, greedy. Have any of you noticed that the offering plate's pretty empty by the time it gets to the back? <laughs> and you're like, how are we paying the bills around here? <laughs> you know what? Many of you, including Amy and I, we give online. We just have it direct traffic. Just to let you know, we prefer that. It's consistent. But here's a practice for you in the context of worship. When the offering plate goes by, instead of listening to the script of, I wonder if my neighbor thinks that I'm a non-Christian, why don't you just say, Lord, everything I've given to you online, I give as an offering to you and make it a worshipful moment. Agreed? Another way you can respond is through prayer, through, through prayers of gratefulness and praise. Or how about this one? Respond through serving, that you've seen the Lord for who he really is, and now you want to make your life a, a sacrificial offering unto him by serving somewhere at your church or in your neighborhood or your community. Or what about... Like Isaiah, you respond through confession. You see the holiness of God. It reveals the darkness of your heart. You respond through confession. It's an appropriate response of worship. Or what about obedience? That you live a life of faithfulness because you've seen God's faithfulness to you. Or what about just observing the ordinances of the church? Today, Ken was baptized. And if you talk to Ken, this dude has come to know the Lord and he could not wait to get here. He was here an hour early. He will stay an hour late to meet you in the foyer and sign autographs. He <laughs> loves the Lord. And today was a huge day for him to express it, right, Steve? He's fired up. Or through communion. Or through observing Advent. Or Lent. See God for who he really is. And then give an appropriate response. Now, can you think of a time in your life when you've truly worshiped? If this is an accurate definition, can you think of a time in your life where you've worked it out? I would hope if you've been coming here for a while, some of you can point to specific mornings in here gathered as the body of Christ when you worship the Lord. That the scriptures were taught 
You saw God for who he really is. You saw your own heart and there was something that happened in you. I can think of many for me in this room and even the old room if you've been here a long time. Can you think of a time where you've been in nature and you've seen the glory of God put on display and you've worshiped? I worshiped at a wedding a month ago. One of my friends got married and she's a little bit older. So we've been praying and waiting on this. And after they did their vows, they, they played a worship song and she and her groom sang together and the congregation sang over them about the faithfulness of God. And I wanna tell you, for those of you who were there, there wasn't a dry eye in the place. And we worshiped God and we thanked him that he is faithful. Have you worked this definition out in your own life? Well, I wanna, I wanna bring the final phase of the teaching in with, with you to consider three contexts in which you can work this out. Three manners, if you will. First is the obvious one. You can worship God collectively, communally, as the corporate gathering in the congregation. But the second one is this, that you can do this personally. That this can be an individual exercise Monday to Saturday for you, where you're interacting with the Lord, he's revealing himself to you and you're responding. And then the third one would be, you can actually worship the Lord, respond to him through the way you live. Let's think through each one of those. The first is the corporate. That we gather together to worship the Lord through teaching and song and observing the ordinances. That's what we're doing right now. We're engaged in corporate worship. We're gathering with other believers. We're doing church. And this is the most familiar and easily grasped context of, of worship. So, while we're talking about it, I thought it might be helpful just to talk a little inside stuff for Fellowship Rogers. Can we talk about worship about us a little bit? As one of the people on the worship team, I find our congregation unique at this point in our history because we have a very broad grouping of ages and denominational backgrounds, and we're trying to bring you all together to worship. So if you'll look around the room We've got some people who just graduated from college that are in the room, or even some high school students in here. And we got some great Grammys in here. Great Grammys? We've got some people in here who have a Catholic background. And people who have a Methodist background. People who have a Baptist background. And maybe like me, you're predominantly unchurched. So my first day I walked in the doors, I was like, what is this thing? And yet we're trying to bring unity and focus on Christ. And so it has its advantages. I love that great Grammy's worshiping next to young adult. And it also has its challenges. You know what? Every single Sunday in here is too loud. And did you know that every single Sunday in here is too soft? And did you know that every single Sunday in here has songs that somebody doesn't like? And did you know that every single Sunday, somebody walks in here and sees who's teaching and it's like, oh. <laughs> we are a diverse group. And so it has its advantages. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Three to four generations all under one roof worshiping one Lord. But it also has its challenges. So I want to give you some thoughts and I'm going to deliver it in the form of my mentor's favorite tool, a chart. Here's some things to think about. One is I think we need to balance our freedom of expression with consideration from those. We do have charismatics amongst us. Maybe people with a more expressive background. So when you come to church, you wanna stand up and raise your hands. You might wanna clap a little bit. You might even have a tambourine in your backpack. <laughs> I would just say you be you, amen? We're kinda like the frozen chosen. We could use a little more movement in our services. It's so subdued. Sometimes when somebody raises their hands, we're like, yes. <laughs> so you be you. I know it's a big room. I know you feel like everybody's looking at you. You be you. And we actually need your expressiveness to draw some of us out. But be considerate of those around you. If you're going to get a little wild, sit in the back. <laughs> a second consideration would be we need to have preference for our style, and at the same time, maintain appreciation for all styles. Amen? 
So some of you like um, really new songs and choruses. You like it with the electric guitar and that kind of thing. And some of you are wondering where the choir ropes are. And you may like to sit a little more reverently. And you would like just a musical piece for a time of meditation. And I just want you to know our goal is to deliver all of that to you. It's just going to be spread out over time. We'll be broad and we'll try to get to your place. But here's the deal. Worship is incumbent upon the worshiper. And so it's your job to find a way to worship when you come in this place. And just know that your neighbor may be in the very rapture of heaven singing a hymn that you think is boring. Amen? A third thing is that we need to balance excellence in our work while maintaining authenticity in our heart. This is not a performance. I just want you to know that the people in the green room have worked really hard and we're gonna try to do our best. We don't want sour notes. We don't wanna be off key. I don't wanna misspeak. And at the same time, we just wanna have a genuine heart when we do that. And we want that for you too. This is not a performance. This is worship. Last one is that we prefer participation over presentation. So this is not a concert. This is not, who was here last night? Snoop. Anybody go to Snoop? Raise your hand if you went to Snoop. (laughs) Bunch of liars. Bunch of liars. Hey, we're not selling tickets. And I just want you to know that you're the choir. You're the choir. Heath is our lead worshiper. And he's participating too. We value participation over presentation. Another thought I have about Fellowship Rogers right now is that we have the beauty of the live stream, and at the same time, I think it's a threat. I love the live stream. I love that we can deliver a worship and teaching experience to our shut-ins, to people who are out of town, or people who are feeling under the weather. I also love that the live stream is enabling us to broaden our reach nationally and internationally. But it was never and is not what we prefer to be your worship experience. There's just something special and I think something biblical about worshiping shoulder to shoulder, in person, raising our collective voices, making a public declaration. And you can't do that at home in your PJs eating waffles. And you certainly can't serve from home. Hebrews 10 says that do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But keep encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Remember, we're not just downloading content to catch up on our series like Netflix. A a last thought on Roger's worship is, if you are a talented musician or vocalist or want to participate in the choir or you're good at gadgets and want to be on our tech team, we have a new worship pastor, Heath Gilbert. He's here from Louisiana and he doesn't know anybody. And he needs help. He's building his team. And so if you're interested, just email us, worship at fellowshiprogers.org. I will caveat that with this saying. If you've tried out four times and been turned down, don't do that to Heath. (laughs) This isn't your third time at American Idol. Just let it, let it be. Did I say that out loud or was that just in my head? (laughs) So corporate worship, seconds, personal worship. This one's easy. What you do on Monday to Saturday is just as important as what you do on Sunday. And that's what we've been trying to get you to do this summer in the Rhythm Series is to practice personal, intimate worship with the Lord, to go deep with him. I hope you've been equipped. The last one may catch you off guard. Have you ever thought about the way you live being an offering of worship to the Lord? When you surrender your thoughts, your motives, your words, your actions unto him as an act of worship, Romans 12, 1 says it beautifully. I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, as living offerings of praise. This is holy and pleasing to God, and it is your spiritual act of what? Worship. It says nothing about singing or going to church. Being kind can be an act of worship. Helping your neighbor can be an act of worship. Approaching your work with integrity and competence could be an act of worship. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Do it as an act of worship to the King. We can live faithfully in each area of our life 
So I'll leave the application up to you. You've heard what worship is. You've seen three ways you can apply it. In your life right now, where do you need to step up your game? Where do you need to give a boost of intentionality? Would you pray with me? Well, Lord Jesus, we declare this morning that you and you alone are worthy of worship. And so, Father, I pray that you would reveal yourself to us. Let us see you for who you really are. And then, Lord, prompt us, lead us to give you an appropriate response. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Would you stand with me? Jesus, my Jesus, my Savior, oh, there is none like you, all of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty Lord. He's our comfort.
and I, uh, Derek. Wow, Derek, that's a, that's a choice. Thank that's, you. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I'm getting ready. Y'all may have a seat. I'm getting ready for the family swim night at the Rogers Aquatic Center. Who's joining me? Yes, yeah. absolutely. So you wondering about this? I was kind of curious if you're, it's, it's yeah, tonight, so you know. It's, my kids think it's funny when I wear it, this little uh, flamingo. Okay. It especially makes me feel kind of young and hip because we were on vacation playing with my kids and this older gentleman comes up to me and goes, hey, grandpa. I'm like, yeah, I'm their dad. <laughs> so not a grandpa. I was like, bald is beautiful, bro. Bald is beautiful. <laughs> So also, I almost kind of got stuck in a water slide that really wasn't fit for a larger man. So I'm wearing my life jacket. It can never be too safe. <laughs> Safety first, right? Safety first. Wow. Yeah. Stuck in a waterfall. That's, that's good for the water heart. Water slide. Water slide. Yes. Not waterfall, right? Right. Well, you look great. Thank it's you. It's going to be a fun night for Thank sure. You. Yes. Please come. I'll be there. He'll be here, right? I'll be there. Awesome. Well, hey, speaking of fun, we have something for the ladies of fellowship. We have a really fun, just women's summer potluck. We're going to be doing it not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday night, July 26th. We're over at the lodge from six to eight. So dust off your recipe cards and look for your family favorite recipes, main dish, side dish, appetizer, dessert, whatever you want to bring. Just join us for a fun night of connection and laughter um, around the table. We would love to see you. And I know Beth Davies has been talking up this award-winning dish that she's bringing, so I can't wait to try that. So y'all have to ask her about that one too. But easy to come. Just there's a, well, I thought we had a QR code. You can register online just to let us know that you're going to be there. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. Bring your women in your life and we'll have a, we'll have a great time. So yeah, another fun thing. Thanks, Christy. And today is the last day to turn in your backpack supplies for oh, yeah. Samaritan Community Center. So there are some canisters in the hallway, so please turn those in today. Sounds great. Also, if you are needing prayer this morning, please feel free to walk over to our prayer room here. We'll have a couple there ready to receive you and pray with you. So, Fellowship, have a great rest of your day, and we'll, we'll see, see you tonight, tonight, right? 615 yeah. Rogers Aquatic Center. Yep. Love you.